own for her husband's funeral the following day. Sir Keir Starmer says the apology shows how seriously Boris Johnson has degraded the office of Prime Minister. The Labour leader says Mr Johnson should be offering Her Majesty his resignation. An Australian court has ordered Novak Djokovic to be detained from 8am tomorrow. He will, however, be allowed to attend his lawyer's offices to prepare his case. It follows a government decision to revoke his visa for a second time, saying it was in the public interest. The unvaccinated tennis star previously won his court appeal against being deported. The first Grand Slam of the year starts on Monday. Harry Dunn's alleged killer, Anne Sekoulas, will no longer face a court hearing on Tuesday. That's due to an ongoing discussion with the Crown Prosecution Service. The US citizen is accused of causing death by dangerous driving following a fatal crash in August 2019. Sekoulas had diplomatic immunity asserted on her behalf by the US government and was able to leave the UK. Virginia Dufre says she's pleased a judge has ruled her civil sex abuse case against the Duke of York can go ahead. Ms Dufre says she wants to expose the truth. Prince Andrew denies all of the allegations against him. It's after the Duke was stripped of his royal patronages and military titles. Royal commentator Dickie Arbiter says Andrew's legal team now have some difficult decisions to make. He's had his comeuppance. He's going to have to now fight this case. He's got several options. Fight the case, uh, pay off. Uh, but paying off comes at a price, it, not only the value, but also an apology. An apology then is seen by many as an admission of guilt. He's in a no-win situation. Uh, and being in a no-win situation, there's no way back for him. French authorities say a man in his 20s has died after being pulled from the water in the Channel. 32 people were rescued near Calais suffering from hypothermia after their boat got into difficulties. More people made the journey through freezing waters to the UK yesterday than in the whole month of January last year. The government will hold a review into how a Chinese agent was able to get so close to senior British politicians. It comes after MI5 warned the agent had been interfering in UK politics. China has denied the allegations, saying it has no need to buy influence in any foreign parliament. Security Minister Damien Hines told GB News MI5 issued the alert to put a stop to the spy's activities. This is an example of our system working, having detected it and then using this notice to, to disrupt it and to, and to warn effectively uh, other people. Um, so, as I say, you know, it, 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 it's the system at work and these notices are one, one tool that the security service has at its, has at its disposal. But what we've seen uh, yesterday is a disruption of this, of this activity. I'm afraid that we're likely to see more of these uh, in, 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 in the future. Wales's First Minister Mark Drakeford has announced plans to remove COVID restrictions. GB News' Wales correspondent Lily Hewitson has the details. At this afternoon's press conference, the First Minister Mark Drakeford told me about his roadmap, which will take Wales back to alert level zero. This is a four-stage plan which sees nightclubs reopen and crowds welcome back to sporting events here in Wales. Now, this starts tomorrow with the number of people who can attend an outdoor event rising from just 50 to 500. From the 21st of January, sports events will be able to welcome back crowds and on the 28th, nightclubs will be able to reopen. On the 10th of February, Welsh Government will return back to a three-week cycle of the review of Covid restrictions here in Wales, but the First Minister told me this is all a big if, so long as Covid cases here in Wales continue to decline. Lily Hewitson there. North Korea has fired what appear to be two new short-range ballistic missiles. It's in response to fresh U.S. sanctions against the regime in Pyongyang. The missiles travelled over 250 miles before landing in the sea. It's the third weapons launch by North Korea this month. Members of Insulate Britain were released from prison this morning after they broke an injunction preventing them from protesting on roads. They're among 10 people who were jailed for breaking the government's injunction on the M25. Members of the activist group took part in a series of protests that staged blockades on major roads between September and November last year. 
This is GB News. We'll bring you more as it happens. But now back to We Need to Talk About with Nana. Right, so before we get stuck into our first story, you should be advised that we'll be using some derogatory terms that some might find offensive. How would you like it if someone called you a slut? Now, for the purpose of this conversation, I'm imagining that you're female. It's not a word that I associate with myself, nor would I use it to describe other women. That's because it's pretty offensive and usually used in a derogatory way. In fact, the dictionary definition is a woman who has many casual partners. And actually, there's nothing wrong with a woman having many casual partners and to take charge of her own sex life. Yet, despite the dictionary definition, the word slut is stigmatised and still, more often than not, used to demean and debase an individual who behaves in this manner. So you'll be surprised to learn that in guidelines about inclusive language, the British Psychological Society encourages its members some 60,000 of them, to use, to use clients' preferred terms and to refer to them in including so-called reclaimed words like slut. The society went on to back this up in tweets, claiming this is OK because the word has been reclaimed by the slut walk movement. Now, I can only imagine that this is maybe a niche group of women never been insulted in this way and don't fully understand the connotations of being called this, but for a national body representing psychologists to give their members the go-ahead to describe clients as sluts based on a niche movement is beyond comprehension. Why would anyone use the word slut to describe themselves? By all means, call yourself that for a joke. But expect a therapist to refer to you as one in a professional setting? No, it hasn't been reclaimed. It is still an insult. But what do you think? So jo joining me now is Dr. Jessica Taylor, author and founder of Victim Focus and behavioural psychologist Joe Hemmings. All right, Jessica, let's start with you. First, what do you think about the psychologist using these particular terms? I think it should never, ever leave our mouths, ever. I just, it's a complete no from me. I don't believe this word is reclaimed at all. Um, most of the psychologists I've seen have responded to this are pretty shocked. They don't feel it's reclaimed either. I think we're in the power dynamic with our clients, you know, like um, for me, I'm not a practitioner psychologist, but I do a lot of work around this. So if you think that, like you say, you have a psychologist in a session working with uh, a woman or a girl who have, you know, they're at their vulnerable stage they've come to get some support they're talking about some of the most sensitive things that have ever happened to them we're in a power dynamic we're more powerful than them in that situation we're the professional there's just no way there's just no way on earth i would ever suggest to a psychologist um that we would train and work with that it would be okay to use any type of derogatory term a slur um like these um interested me that the only two examples that were given in the guidance was dyke and slot, both misogynistic, both aimed at women. Um, it's just a huge no from me. I think that we have an ethical duty to do no harm to our clients. We should never, ever refer to them in a derogatory, harmful, unethical manner. And that's what this is to me. What, even if they ask you to call them that? If, if, if they asked you to call them that, Jessica, would that still be unacceptable in your eyes? In, in mine, it is, yeah. So, for example, um, a lot of my work in the last decade has been with women and girls who've been subjected to violence and abuse. And they will often describe themselves whilst they're talking about the abuse or the things they've been through. They might say, I'm a bit of a slut. Or they might say, well, I did wear slutty clothes. Or they might say, well, you know, everybody thinks I'm a slut now. So those types of conversations come up all the time anyway. I would never mirror that language back ever. like Because then I would be validating that as a real description of that woman or girl so you know even if uh, say for example a psychologist or a therapist was working with a woman who said well I am a slut and uh, I'm proud of it and uh, I want you to refer to me as a slut I think that professional is well placed to sort of say well um I totally get that that you that that's how you feel but I'm not going to use that language towards you 
um, mm. and you know, this is a safe space I've created, and I, I don't, I don't want to use those words about you. And I think that you should be able to do that in the same way that, you know, um, this is a slightly different point, I guess. But in the guidance, they talk about using the word dyke uh, for lesbian women, and um, and they say that that's a reclaimed word too. And I don't agree with that. Um, as a lesbian, I, I don't agree with that. If somebody called me a dyke, I would expect that to be with malicious intent. But I do know women that um, identify themselves as a dyke. They would call themselves a dyke um, and they're proud of that. But I would not call them that. So so I would accept that that's how they see themselves and that's the word that they want to use. But as a professional in a setting, I would never then use that word to describe them in any way or to talk to them or to talk about them ever. Well, what about, um, Joe? what's your take on this then? Because you've heard um, what Jessica thinks, but what's, what's your view? Well, well, I 100% agree with Jessica. You know, I am a practitioner psychologist. I am a very proud member of the British Psychological Society, who I do think need to always be up to date and inclusive. I would never, ever use a term like that to a client. Our job is to understand why they would use these self-detrimental, self-derogatory terms about themselves, to find out what's going on, to not to reaffirm them, not to reinforce them, but to understand why they're using that terminology about themselves. If I were to feed that back, even if they asked me to use that, I would refuse. It, it, it's not professional. It's hugely inappropriate. It's not helpful in any therapeutic session whatsoever. And Jessica's right. They are words generally certainly used in, in that feature in the proposals about women. They're derogatory terms. And my job is to try and m make people understand why they might use a word like that about themselves and actually to try and not think of themselves in those ways. I certainly wouldn't want to reinforce the message. So what do you think, Joe, is going on with the British Psychological Society? I mean, they're supposed to know better. And so far, uh, you know, we've struggled to find anybody that actually agrees with them. What do you think is going on? They said it's about inclusivity, but what exactly are they including? Well, I understand it. Look, the, the BPS, big society, 60,000 members, they need to keep up with the tone uh, of mental health in this country. They need to understand perhaps about gender fluidity now if you have a client who presents as a as a man but wants to be called a woman that's fine that's all good that's inclusive but i think uh, i know i'm not the only psychologist who believes this that it's gone a step too far it's gone to the point where you are actually counterproductive in your therapy if you are going to allow or co allow yourself to to use one of these derogatory terms about your client even if they use it about themselves i think that just is a step too far to i wouldn't even call it inclusivity it just feels very unprofessional and uncomfortable it's interesting that advice should come from such a reputable body um does that make them does that discredit them in some way would you say jessica my so I am also like um, you've just said. Like, I, I'm a proud member. I really appreciate the BPS, and they support a lot of what I do, especially as quite a radical writer and thinker. So I am kind of hoping I've got my fingers crossed that they're going to listen to this and they're going to take this on board and they're going to take this seriously and change it. So I hope then that it wouldn't discredit them because they would see the response from practitioner psychologists and academics and theorists that argue that this word has not been reclaimed and that their response in public, you know, in that tweet where they said, well, you know, uh, this is a reclaimed word now, feminists have reclaimed it, it's not offensive, was wrong. It, it's inaccurate um, and it's misogynistic to suggest so. So I would kind of hope that they change that and accept that that was incorrect. But I would, I would really like to, and I've already contacted them to talk to them about consulting on it. I would really like to explore why their two examples were misogynistic. Like, why is it that really bothered me like why are those the two examples but also i would like to know the sort of rationale behind it so if we're going to start under the guise of inclusivity using slurs what slurs are out of bounds do you know what i mean like and, yeah. and if a psychologist then became um abusive oppressive racist homophobic towards their client and then said oh you know it was in the name of inclusivity like, how are you? Where do you draw the line? Like, what slur is allowed and what slur is not allowed? Um, and also, but then also, also, 
what so do who they draws mean that line? by yeah exactly who draws it where is it drawn and who decides it and then what do they mean by referring to them with the preferred term like do they mean that they're asking the practitioner to write in the notes um the slot said like what do they mean like how well, how would you refer to somebody as a slot i don't understand I, I, well uh, you you and me both were, were a little bit nonplussed they have provided a statement thank you so much uh, to jessica taylor dr jessica taylor and also joe hemmings lovely to talk to you both well this is uh, we approached the british psychological society for a statement on this and a spokesperson said this the BPS is clear that it is down to the individual practitioner's professional judgment to determine if the client is using terms that could be considered derogatory in an empowering way rather than in a self-loathing way that may be detrimental to them. The complexities of this issue are not easily debated on social media. However, it is important to recognise that for a small number of people, reclaiming phrases is a form of empowerment. This does not mean that we advocate the widespread use of language that may consider to be derogatory. Uh, the statement also said the guidelines in question were due, to review, due for review in 2022, and this process will start shortly to ensure that the guidelines are in the line with current legislation, evidence and practice. Mm, interesting stuff. Let's bring in my studio guest. And I'm delighted to be joined in the studio by, by comedian and musician Jonathan Cogan. No. Uh, so, Jonathan, what do you think about the British Psychological Society uh, suggesting it's fine to use words like um, slut? Well, having thought about it for a good 30 seconds, I reckon it does depend on a case-by-case -case basis. You generally associate those words with being quite harmful, misogynistic and quite hurtful. But if the person feels they can take some power back, by reclaiming those terms and being called them. And if it helps them in their therapy session, like, fantastic. Like, that can help. You it actually counterintuitive, that. though. Yeah, it's interesting yeah. you should say that, though, because the psycholo psychologists that we had on there both yeah. said that that would be a derogatory term and actually may yeah. reinforce a negative perception of themselves. And that's definitely the word a possibility. Negative. But I guess not everyone interprets the same word in the same way. I mean, I've been called worse by my therapist, but that's probably because really? I'm a difficult client. But, um, but yeah, it just, it just depends on how that person feels when they call those words. And if it helps, great. Although intuitively, I kind of see them as a bit derogatory. Yeah, but you see, then, but isn't it the duty of a psychologist or psychotherapist yeah. to ensure that they are not enforcing negative, uh, negative things onto their client? Yeah. And actually, their job would be to help to bring this person back to a sort of reality, to live in an environment that, that will be positive to them rather than one that's detrimental. Surely terms like that won't really help. Uh, yeah, I, I do agree with that. Um, intuitively, that's how I think that would go because these are negative terms. I would say they're probably outlier cases where people find being called that could be helpful in either like a discussion to talk about certain issues or how they perceive themselves. But generally, I do agree with you. It seems like these are quite harsh terms that a professional who's caring for someone shouldn't use. It'd be like if you went to the doctor because you were like overweight and they called you. Uh, What's the non-offensive word fatty. for that person? Yeah, fatty, or like a, a big unit, or a chonker. Um, all, all... I've heard that one before. <laughs> oh, yeah, um, it's, uh, I think it's a medical term, uh, a chonker. But, um, Is it? No. Um, it yeah, I think you wouldn't want your doctor calling you that. You'd be like, oh, you're overweight, and you know, try doing this. Yeah, so it does seem like they have some responsibility not to do these harsh words, unless in an outlier case they do actually help. But I don't know. I, I can't imagine that being called that would help me. At no, all. I agree. Yeah. I think I put, think I'd probably give them someone a right hook on that <laughs> one or a left hook, whichever hook's easy. But I, I really want to know what you think. So get in touch. Email gbviews at gbnews.uk or why not tweet me at gbnews so that I know your thoughts and what the nation really thinks on this matter. Uh, if you've just joined me, I'm Nana Aquir. This is GB News on TV and radio. It's time for a short break and a check on the weather. Hello again. Some parts woke up with dense fog this morning, but that will mostly be replaced by sunshine today. Some low cloud and fog will linger and it'll be damp in the far north as this weather front clears. But the rain tending to peter out on the broad scale. The weather is dominated by a large area of high pressure with light winds and dry weather for the vast majority. And once most of that fog lifts, we'll, we will see some sunny spells across much of England, Wales, into eastern Scotland. But a few fog patches will remain, for example, parts of the West Midlands, perhaps parts of southwest England, seeing that stubborn fog. And where that fog lingers, it will be chilly temperatures, not getting out of the low single figures. Otherwise, 6 to 8 Celsius in the south, a bit milder for the north of Scotland, even if it is rather damp here. 
10 Celsius, the max in the far north. Outbreaks of generally light rain and drizzle in the far north of Scotland. Some low cloud for much of Scotland and Northern Ireland. That will keep things frost and fog free here overnight. But fairly extensive low cloud, mist and fog will develop across large parts of England and Wales, particularly eastern England. Low cloud also affecting South Wales, central and southwest England through the night. And this low cloud, mist and fog will be slow to clear if it does clear during Saturday. Some places staying grey and gloomy through much of the day with poor visibility, especially for eastern England. Some brighter spells further north and west, but a few showers also possible for western areas and the far north. Another cold day where that fog and low cloud lingers, temperatures not rising above the low single figures. And then a lot of cloud remains into Saturday night. But one change on the way, a band of rain pushing into the far northwest as we end Saturday. That will sweep south across the country by Sunday, clearing the skies, leading to sunnier conditions in the north during Sunday. But cloud remains further south. Hello there, I'm Eamon. And I'm Isabel. And you're watching the GB News digital stream across the United Kingdom. And around the world. If you're here in the UK, you can also watch us on your TV screen. GB News is Freeview Channel 236. On Sky, we're Channel 515. 626 on Virgin Media. Just remember, you might need to retune your TV to watch the channel. Yeah, and if you are doing that, find out more about retuning by going to gbnews.uk. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. Dan Wooten, join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from 6 to half past 9 on GB News. It's just coming up to 25 minutes after 2 o'clock. I'm Nana Akwe. This is GB News. Now, the woman who was accused Prince Andrew of sexually abusing her has praised a US judge's decision to allow her civil case against him to continue. Virginia Guffray claims that the prince abused her in 2001 when she was 17 and a minor under US law. Prince Andrew strongly denies the allegations. Yesterday, it was revealed that the prince's military titles and royal patronages had been returned to the Queen. He'll also stop using his HRH title, according to a royal source. So I'm delighted to now be joined on the show by the broadcaster and royal commentator Jenny Bond. Um, so, Jenny, what are your thoughts on the latest developments? I think probably the Queen and her advisers uh, will have woken up this morning probably relieved uh, that the headlines are not about Prince Andrew. I think they'd be quite, I feel quite fortunate that there have been major uh, ructions in the Downing Street story and also the Djokovic story, which has kind of knocked this off the headlines a bit because normally it would have been up there. So a measure of relief, but also I think they feel that they've done the only thing they could, which is if you like, lance the boil somewhat, which is Prince Andrew, the toxicity that surrounds him, uh, the damage he was doing to the brand of the royal family. And I think they uh, moved swiftly to separate the man from the monarchy. This is what it's about. It's about defending the monarchy, 
putting a wall around, a wall of defence around the institution that the Queen so cares about so deeply. Mm, but I, I don't think that's going to make any difference at all because people still associate Andrew clearly with the monarchy. There's no way out of that one. What does it actually mean for Prince Andrew, though, him having no HRH and his title stripped from him? How would that affect him as he moves forward? Well, it's very humiliating for him, but I think you're right. Um, he can't suddenly become totally unroyal. You know, he's going to defend this case as a private citizen. Well, yes, OK, so I don't know how they'll refer to him if it gets to a uh, full court procedure. Um, but he will remain very much in uh, the public eye as far as the court procedure is concerned. Elsewhere, he will not be seen. He will not carry out official duties. I mean, after his disastrous Newsnight interview, when his mother had mm. to sack him from official duties, um, he always felt he probably could come back. But yesterday, the Queen had to act decisively. She summoned him to the castle. It was a 45-minute meeting. He went with his lawyer, actually, Gary Bloxham, who has become quite a close advisor. Uh, but the Queen was having nothing that she didn't want um, him in the room, it seems. So he sat in the car park. And uh, the Queen then uh, decided that he really must now step down permanently. So she sacked him once and for all. And his uh, affiliations, his military affiliations and his uh, patronages are being handed out uh, to other members of the royal family. So there's no going back. Well, so what do you think then? Um... In terms of the Queen, then, do you think this was the right move for her? I think it was the only move for her, really. It had become um, untenable. She was, she was sent a letter by 150 military um, veterans who all said, please, we don't want this man as our Colonel-in-Chief or our Honorary Colonel anymore. Um, do something about it. And I think at that point, the pressure became overwhelming. I mean, and the pressure isn't off on his other titles either. Just the latest development is that one of the um, MPs who represents York has said, we don't want him to be Duke of York either. That, that is a, a taint on our city. Um, one or two other voices in York are saying the same thing. So uh, that, that's absolutely in the gift of the Queen. He was made the Duke of York on the day of his wedding. Um, and there's been no word from the palace that they're considering stripping him of that as well. But the pressure will continue. Mm, it's not looking good for him at all. I mean, obviously, he has denied everything. Now, another royal-related story today is uh, Downing Street apologising to Buckingham Palace following revelations that uh, two parties were held the night before the Duke of Edinburgh's funeral. Well, yes. Um, I mean, it's unbelievable, quite frankly, isn't it? I think as one of the sketch writers of the paper said the other day, he, re he said, really, I've got to resign or Boris Johnson's got to resign because I, I can't make fun of this anymore. <laughs> it's doing it for itself. Um, I'm sure that the Queen must have... Oh, she must have been despairing of her government, really, when she realised that she had to attend her husband's funeral alone and sit alone, as we all saw so graphically, that image, an image that, that represented the suffering of so many other families throughout the country who'd had to do the same thing. And the very night before that funeral, there was a party, an event, but a party, it seems, in Downing Street. Um, it's, well, you know, if I was the Queen, I'd say it's unforgivable. She won't say that, but I'm sure she would graciously have accepted the apology. But um, goodness knows what she thought behind the closed door. It's really good to talk to you. That's uh, Jenny Bond, the Royal Correspondent. Uh, if you just join me, welcome back. I'm Nana Aquir on GB News. Now it's time for the section of the show where we go about building our womanifesto. And all my guests get to nominate three policies that they would make they think would make the world a better place. And as High Empress of the show, I'll decide if they make the cut. Now, my special guest, Jonathan Cogan, is clearly a man. I think he is anyway. But uh, we're giving him a free pass today. And he gets to be in charge of policy. So what would you change, Jonathan? So I've got a, a couple of policies that I thought up this morning. Um, now, the first one I was thinking would be a, a social media Sabbath, where you have one day a week where nobody can log on to social media. You're not allowed to post, you're not allowed to read it. It's one day off. Uh, and, um, and uh, yeah, I think that could do a lot of good because, as we all know, social, uh, overuse of social media leads to a lot of um, sort of mental um, 
well, it can lead to mental illness and just, you know, not um, very, what's the word I was looking for? There's a word for well-being. There we go. Yes, okay. it can lead to a, sort of a lack of mental well-being. Now, it's very addictive, and especially for young women, it can be quite uh, problematic. It can lead to uh, lots of problems with body image. If you're, you know, if you're scrolling all day looking at the most beautiful women um, in the world and also the most photoshopped women in the world, it can lead to a lot of um, uh, self-esteem issues. And also, it's just it's super addictive. It saps all your dopamine. I just think one day a week when no one can use it, could give us the time to like detox and recharge away from it. That'd be handy for like anything, wouldn't it? Really, yeah, for that, everyone, yeah. not just women, but mm -hmm. just to stay away. Does everyone stay away on the same day, or is it just? Yeah, I think one day a week. I don't know what it'd be. Can like, it be any day? So I, I might choose Tuesday. Other people might choose Wednesday. Or is it specifically the same? No, I day? think we've all got to do it. The same on the same day. Yeah, I don't know how we'd enforce mm. it. Some kind of. Well, you'd know if someone was on it because then they'd be on it, and you Very and true. you and if you knew, then you'd be on it as well because you'd have read it. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Oh, then I'd be in trouble. Yeah. So that's that, yeah, very good. I like that one. That's a good one. All right. What's your next? Thing? Okay. So now this came from speaking to a friend of mine. She's a single uh, female. She lives by herself, and she's just bought a house, and she's been decorating it. And she was saying she had a lot of difficulty with, um, I guess, in communicating with the tradesmen who she's been working with, and that goes to the painters, and decorators, and the uh, the electricians and also people like car uh, mechanics. She often feels that she's being uh, talked down to and maybe misled about the price. Mm. And if there is a man there in the house, uh, the tradesman will often just direct all the questions and talk to him as if she wasn't there, even though it's got nothing to do with them. So my policy would be to try and encourage and incentivize um, more women to become, to learn those skills, to start those businesses, and then other women can then hire them. So how, just, yeah. how about, let's do it the other way around, you train those men to sort themselves out and behave in a way oh, we've been that's trying much more years. appropriate. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. That's the way around I'd yeah, do it, but yeah, I yeah. hear you. I, I, the, I, your actual idea I like, but I think the way it's going... Yeah, about, that's not a bad shout. I don't yeah. see why we should do all the training. And what about uh, your, your third? My third and most serious point would be a, uh, a universal dress amnesty, where women are allowed to wear the same outfit or dress to more than one um, social occasion without being judged by anyone, and I just think it causes a lot of stress, especially uh, with my girlfriend. She's always trying to find a new outfit, and quite frankly, I'm sick of returning ASOS parcels. I don't want to do it anymore. I've, I've returned too many ASOS parcels, and it's awkward, because you go to the shop, and the guy always thinks you're going to buy something, but you don't, you just scan the parcel, and then you leave. Mm. That, yeah, it's, it's a tough world. You're taking all the fun out of stuff, though. I love going to buy another outfit. I just deliberately try not to wear the same thing twice. It's great. True, but that must be quite a lot of pressure, right, to constantly find... Well, on the news, do you have to wear a different outfit every time, or can you, like, cycle them in? I try. Wear something different all the time. Yeah, it's so that's, that's a lot of work. Mm, and you can claim it back. The work <laughs> well, well, you yeah. have to wear different stuff, it's true. Yeah, OK, I'm going to look into that. But, yeah, no, but yeah, interesting stuff. Thank hmm. you very much. No worries. We shall be back with that, but if you just join me, I'm Nana Aquir. This is GB News on TV and on DAB. After the break, it's time for my guests to have their say. We'll hear what Jonathan Cogan needs to talk about. But first, it's time for your latest news headlines. It's 2.35. I'm Rhiannon Jones in the GB newsroom. Number 10 has apologised to Buckingham Palace after it emerged two parties were held the day before the Duke of Edinburgh's funeral. Downing Street says it was deeply regrettable that they took place at a time of national mourning. Restrictions meant the Queen had to sit alone for her husband's funeral the following day. An Australian court has ordered Novak Djokovic to be detained from 8am tomorrow. He will, however, be allowed to attend his lawyer's offices to prepare his case. It follows a government decision to revoke his visa for a second time, saying it was in the public interest. The unvaccinated tennis star previously won his court appeal against being deported. The first Grand Slam of the year starts on Monday. Virginia Giuffre has welcomed a US judge's decision to allow her civil sex abuse case against the Duke of York to go ahead. Ms Giuffre says she wants to expose the truth. Prince Andrew denies all of the allegations against him. It comes as the Duke was stripped of his royal patronages and military titles. Harry Dunn's alleged killer, Anne Sekoulas, will no longer face a court hearing on Tuesday due to ongoing discussions with the Crown Prosecution Service. The US citizen is accused of causing death by dangerous driving following a fatal crash in August 2019. She was granted diplomatic immunity by the US government following collision and was able to leave the UK. 
First Minister Mark Drakeford says Wales will return to alert level zero by the end of January, following a rapid decline in COVID cases. From tomorrow, the number of people allowed at outdoor events will rise from 50 to 500. From the 21st of this month, limits will be removed completely. COVID passes, however, will still be required at larger events. And the first female officer to command the Army's number one training regiment is taking over the job from her husband. 42-year-old Lieutenant Colonel Lindsay Kelly will be leading 165 members of staff at the Army Training Centre in Purbright in Surrey. She assumes command from husband Seamus, who plans to continue working in the regiment's headquarters. TV online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. I'll be back at the top of the hour with more. See you then. Hello there, I'm Eamon. And I'm Isabel. And you're watching the GB News digital stream across the United Kingdom. And around the world. If you're here in the UK, you can also watch us on your TV screen. GB News is Freeview Channel 236. On Sky, we're Channel 515. 626 on Virgin Media. Just remember, you might need to retune your TV to watch the channel. Yeah, and if you are doing that, find out more about retuning by going to gbnews.uk. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate. And I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Dan Wilson. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wilson tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. If you've just joined us, where have you been? It's just coming up to 20 minutes to 3 o'clock. I'm Nana Aquir. This is We Need to Talk About on GB News. Right, so it's time now for my esteemed guests to unburden themselves and tell me what they need to talk about. So, Jonathan, you wanted to talk about the controversy over Dame Helen Mirren's casting as former Prime Minister of Israel, Golda Meir, because she's not Jewish. Uh, yes, yeah, so there has been certainly some controversy in that area. It's an interesting discussion, and I think there's been two kinds of controversy. One, the fact that they've cast someone, uh, a Jewish character, as, with an un-Jewish actress. And then the other issue is that there actually hasn't been that much controversy around that, but there might have been had it been a different race or um, like a sexual orientation that was cast differently. So I think those are the two main points there. Personally, I don't feel massively strong about it, but I've had to say, as a, an artist in my heart of hearts, I think really you have to choose the best actress that's going to serve the film, serve the art. You want the person who's going to give the best performance, regardless of um, maybe what group they belong to. And you just want to serve the art. So I guess that would be art over politics in this case. But you know, I'm saying that as a Jewish guy as well. So I, I don't, not that I speak for every Jewish person. I'd like to, but I don't think I should. But um, yeah, I think you just got to really hire the best person for the role and They've got to give the best performance they can give, regardless of, I guess, who they are. So Dame Helen Mirren, yes. is, is she Jewish? She's not Jewish, is she? Or is she uh, Helen Jewish? Mirren isn't, no. She's not Jewish. So is, no. that, is that a good casting or not a good casting? Well, I think she's going to do an amazing job of it. Um, so in which case, I think that is a good casting. Um, 
you could argue that there's, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily argue this. You could argue that they should have tried. I don't, I don't think I necessarily believe that, actually. I think if she does the, the role well, then, you know, power to her. So, so what side of the fence do you sit on this then? So should it be that yeah. if you're Jewish, it should be somebody that is Jewish, or you're saying just the best person for the job? Just the best person, the best person for the job, because you'd have to think, does that work the other way? If, a, you know, if, if Jewish people, sorry, if a Jewish character has to be played by a Jewish person, does that mean that a Jewish person could then never play a non-Jewish character? And that seems counterintuitive and restrictive and... Yeah, it's just about serving the piece, serving the art. Mm, it's interesting, because I actually did, when I, in my days of Amdram, oh, I yeah. did some Amdram in, in this little village where I was living at the time, and I was somebody's um, daughter. I, I, I'd come in from kinder transport, I think it was, but it, I was, oh, what was the mother? I can't remember, but either way, yeah. I was playing the role of a white woman. Okay. But it didn't matter. And well, so, and, and, and it's interesting, because my daughter, who was not the same colour as me, yeah. so clearly she really wasn't my daughter, but, and obviously we're acting, but it didn't matter, so it was irrelevant that that was... Although there was a moment where I sort of broke the third wall and looked at everybody and they <laughs> looked at me and thought, this OK, kid? we'll just suspend <laughs> the air of belief on this one. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, and exactly, like, if it worked in the play, then fantastic, it works. Like, it, it sh I don't think it should be this really strict... What, what, but what about if the character was a disabled character then? Yeah. In which case, would, would you still apply the same logic if that character was supposed to be somebody with a disability and yeah. they picked somebody who was not, uh, did not have a disability mm. and they'd say maybe put them in a wheelchair or something like that? Would, that, would your logic still go yeah, forward a, with that's that? that's a good question. I'd have to think about it. So one example that comes to mind is uh, in Breaking Bad, the series, which is amazing, um, the main character's son um, is uh, partly disabled and that is played by... As, as far as I'm aware, an actor who is partly disabled. Now, I thought that actually really did add um, an element of authenticity to it. And would it feel wrong if a guy was pretending to have that disability for the show? Well, that's acting, isn't it? In, in a way, it feels a bit uncomfortable, but also, I mean, Leonardo DiCaprio played um, someone with uh, mental disabilities um, in the film, and he got, like, that was an amazing role for him. I, yeah, it, it's, it's tricky. It's tricky. Mm. It, it's an interesting discussion, but I think whatever makes the best product, really. Yeah. Okay. But also be respectful. Yeah, also be respectful. Okay, well, this is a debate that's been uh, raging in the entertainment world for some time. So, also joining me now is showbiz journalist Stephanie Tacky. Uh, Stephanie, what's your thoughts on this one? Well, I think it's it's definitely been a big dis discussion in the industry. And I think as the same thing as Jonathan was saying, as long as there's respect towards the role, it's something that could be done. Like, for instance, yesterday, Golda Meir's grandson said that he's happy for Helen Mirren to do play his grandma on screen. He said it's not so much that she's not Jewish, but the main thing is that he wants her to make sure that she gets the essence of the character. And that is always the big thing, making sure that you do the character justice, especially when it's somebody who has lived. And I think someone of Helen Mirren's experience and status, she will definitely bring that to this role. And, you know, Helen Mirren has previously played Jewish characters before to great acclaim. So I think she will do it again. But I don't think it's a one size fits all. Like, for instance, you know, when um, Jodie Turner Smith was playing Anne Boleyn, there was a big furore about her being a black woman playing this historical white woman. I thought personally she did a good job. But as well, I know for the black community, if we was to say a white actor was to play, you know, a historical black figure like Nelson Mandela, I don't think anyone would accept that. So I don't think it always works out. And I think it always has to be like a case to case basis. But we've seen in Bridgerton, Bridgerton was a massive hit. And all of those characters, they weren't they weren't black or they weren't Asian, but they are being played by different colours. And it's been successful. And it's about the acting industry trying to be progressive but I again I do feel like it needs to be done sensitively on a case-to-case -case basis mm, because Bridgerton was fabulous because there was no there was no sort of presumption of what you would be if you were black or what I mean there were servants who were white there were servants who were black there was a mix the duke was black this, so I loved the fact that the whole stereotyping had literally been torn to bits and that that for me is brilliant but realistically uh, Stephanie if you look at this just as you said what if Dame Helen Mirren had been black? Do you think that that would have been acceptable? And I know you said case by case basis. So, uh, uh, and, and also Dame Helen Mirren is a very, very successful actress. It could be played by somebody, she can draw a crowd. But what if this character was played by a black actress? Do you think that that would be acceptable? 
No, I, to be honest, I don't think it will be because, again, when you're playing someone as powerful as Golda Meir, I think you need someone who's as, you know, as close to her as possible. And I think Helen Mirren, she's had that experience and she could do that pretty well. It's like, for instance, getting a white person to play Winnie Mandela. There's sometimes culture does seep through and it does help people to bring these characters to life. So that's why I think it has to be a case by case basis and it has to be who is going to be playing who here. And I don't think a black woman would be able to get away with playing Golda Meir at all. No, I, don't, I, think, I think you're probably right on that one. Jonathan, you said that uh, you thought that it should be, you know, on merit, and but you've heard what Stephanie thinks, and uh, mm. what, what, what do you make of that then? What uh, if Golda Meir was a, um, a black actress? What if Oprah said that she was going to play I'd the role? That. Yeah. Um, no, you'd be all right with Oprah doing it? Uh, well, do I think necessarily she'd be the best choice for it? Not necessarily. But if she did an amazing role, then that would be merit. But, it, uh, but I do understand what's being said, that I guess you have to take it on a case-by-case uh, basis and it does depend on the character and it does depend on the actress. I don't know if I have a rule of thumb that can encompass all of it because it is slightly nuanced. But if it makes a good movie, then yeah, great. Mm, I don't know whether the Jewish community would accept uh, that one. I don't think they'd accept that. I, don't, I, I, I think I'm kind of with Stephanie on that as well because if if a white woman said I'll play Winnie Mandela, I'd be like. Uh, not on this yeah. one. Fair enough. <laughs> no. Fair enough. Okay, I can see that. <laughs> That's not going to work. Stephanie, thank you so much for joining me. That's Stephanie Tacky joining us uh, live. Thank you, Stephanie, and also my wonderful guest in studio, Jonathan. Thank you, Abby. Yeah, it's all good, isn't it? So what are your thoughts on this then as well? You can get in touch. You've been emailing us throughout the show with those views. And Michael says, employ the best person for the job who meets the basic requirements of the original character. Uh, Leona says, any woman or man should be able to play any part in acting. It doesn't matter about skin colour or anything else. Mark says, isn't acting about pretending to be someone that you're not? Hmm, very true. Uh, but nowadays, it, it's interesting stuff though, isn't it? It, it is interesting stuff. Keep your thoughts coming at GB News or why not send us uh, that tweet or email at gbviews at gbnews.uk. Well, Nowadays, it's hard to know what's offensive and what isn't. A joke that makes one person laugh out loud might send another to their safe space. Here on We Need to Talk About, we aim to find out. Are wolf whistles offensive? Is holding the door open cringe? Do we really want to split the bill? Well, let's get, this, uh, let's get the uh, same, but from a man's perspective, it's time for our daily trigger warning. So, Johnson, tell us what uh, really gets on your nerves. What, what would you do away with? So, I would ban uh, what I have labelled dream shaming, which is when... And I don't want to be sexist here, but it does seem to happen more with girls to men, is when a woman gets angry with what her husband or boyfriend does in her dream. Now, that's happened to me on a few occasions Does with a few now? different girlfriends, and <laughs> it just... I, what can I do? I'm not in control there. I'm not, you know... Why am I getting blamed? So basically, my, recently my girlfriend woke up from a dream where, I think I can say this, I'd had an orgy with a bunch of her friends. Now, she was furious at me <laughs> for doing... I mean, oh, that it, dream, it's yeah. It's her imagination, dream. yeah. I mean, I've also had the same dream. I just didn't tell her about it. But we can cut that bit out, right? This is... Uh, she's just, this is, yeah, she's yeah, just, yeah, yeah. Great. edit it out later. Perfect. Um, fix it in post. Yeah, but that is the... Uh, that is something that annoys me. Why should I get in trouble for something that someone else dream, dreamed I did? Well, see, look, my little son, Ivory, now he's only four, he wakes up in the morning and he gets really angry at me. And in his dream, <laughs> I've maybe taken away his favourite car, like his Porsche McCann or whatever. So it, it goes is. both ways, fair it enough. It can work yeah, either yeah. way. You think that's... Yeah, so I think this is some hurt that's obviously is still affecting you, isn't oh, it? Oh, yeah, it was about two <laughs> days ago. It <laughs> was it? Two days ago? Yeah. Seriously? Yeah, it was Has she got days. over it, though? Um, yeah, yeah, it's fine, you know. I made her a, a nice breakfast. Oh, well, Cocoa Pops, it's... Added milk, but yeah, still, it's a nice breakfast. It's very, it's, it's the thought that counts, isn't it? Yes, yeah, well, I didn't put that, that much thought into it, but yeah. But at least you did think of something. Yeah. I'm trying to help you. Okay, she made it. She made herself cocoa pops. I was just there, but we made up, and it was fine. Yeah, good. So stronger for it. The thing with this um, whole idea, I mean, have you ever had, had a dream where you actually think that the thing has happened, and oh, then you struggle the to try and sort of you wake up thinking, did that or didn't it? I have dreams where I wake up like sweating and thinking, oh, I've got to get the police coming in this, but like you're literally still in fight or flight mode. You know, I've done a heinous crime, I've got helicopters chasing me, and then you wake up and there's about 15 seconds when you're worried and then you realise it's just a dream. 
And it's such a relief. I actually quite enjoy that experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah. And what do you, and I just want to come back to what we were talking about before, because you were saying that anyone based on merit could play whatever roles. Sure. But what about um, in the case of, say, a white woman playing Winnie Mandela or yeah. in that respect? I just wanted to get your view on that. I didn't get a chance. Yeah, it, do, it does seem like that would be quite problematic. Or maybe. a white guy playing Nelson Mandela. Yeah. And I, I mean, what Gandhi, though, was, wasn't played by somebody from. Yeah, that, that, when did that move? Was that 90s or mm. 2000s? And was there any controversy at the time around that? I don't that? think there was at the time, no. Yeah. But I feel like nowadays that, that wouldn't fly. Um, it was Ben good... Kingsley, actually, who yeah. played Gandhi, yeah. Yeah, I remember we watched that in RE before we went to India on a school trip. Yeah. And he wasn't Indian. No. Cool. <laughs> and what about, because I remember, because I'm quite old, I remember no, Tarzan. No. And yeah. uh, he sort of lived amongst all the, the animals and so on and so forth. Okay. Or some of the American movies where they'd be in in the Wild West type thing, but the Native Americans, so right. the, the actual American Indians were yeah. there. And the ones who were the starring roles would have uh, dark hair but blue eyes, you know, so you could tell that they weren't right. actually. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, it almost seems like if you're casting someone just based on their race, then I guess you should give those opportunities and jobs to people of that race. Whereas in the Helen Mirren situation, she's not being cast for her race or how she looks. She's being cast on her, I guess, her acting ability. Um, so, yeah, again, it just depends on every case. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Interesting stuff. Well, that will obviously be a conversation that will continue because it's, yes. I suppose, as you said, it's case by case basis. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else that you would uh, do away with? You were talking about the whole dream thing and anything. Is there yeah. anything else on your list? Oh, well, to get extremely political, I think do away with deplatforming. Just have, dis have discussions like this, have discussions. You don't have to agree with people um, to invite them into wherever and have a conversation. I think it's incredibly important just to have open debate and, you know, debate in good faith, not when you're trying to attack the other person, but when you really are trying to discuss ideas. And sometimes you're not going to, you know, this happens uh, between religions and, you know, you can have different discussions among, like, political uh, sides of the spectrum, but don't get rid of conversations. Don't don't cancel those things. What about those who come with slightly more extreme views? Because, you know, some of the views... Yeah. There are some people that don't believe in climate change and things yeah. like that. I mean, I won't say why I stand on it, but... You Fair know, enough. I think climates change all the time is one of the things I would say. Right, yeah. Um, but some broadcasters wouldn't, wouldn't have allowed you to even say certain things about climate. Right, well... The thing is, now, I'm not... Yeah, I'll, I'll stand by this. If you are making a point which you have evidence for, say in the case of climate change, you should bring that point forward. Now, probably what's going to happen is you're going to get absolutely destroyed in an argument mm. and all the evidence counter to what you're saying will win, and that's the whole point of it. Mm. Um, but, yeah, as long as, as long as you're not coming with, like, a hateful, agenda. menacing agenda, and yeah. Al and also as long as you're not saying that... Uh... COVID, linking COVID with 5G or some cuckoo yeah. theory. Well, that's true. Mm, that's well, there is that. Listen, Jonathan, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for joining me. That's Jonathan Kogan. He's a comedian and a musician. Well, listen, that's about all I've got time for. I'll be back with my own show, Nana a Queer, on GP News at 4 today, so make sure you join me. But coming up next is The Briefing with Arlene Foster. But first, let's get a catch up with your weather. Hello again. Some parts woke up with dense fog this morning, but that will mostly be replaced by sunshine today. Some low cloud and fog will linger and it'll be damp in the far north as this weather front clears. But the rain tending to peter out on the broad scale, the weather is dominated by a large area of high pressure with light winds and dry weather for the vast majority. And once most of that fog lifts, we'll, we will see some sunny spells across much of England, Wales, into eastern Scotland. But a few fog patches will remain, for example, parts of the West Midlands, perhaps parts of southwest England, seeing that stubborn fog. And where that fog lingers, it will be chilly temperatures, not getting out of the low single figures. Otherwise, 6 to 8 Celsius in the south, a bit milder for the north of Scotland, even if it is rather damp here, 10 Celsius the max in the far north. Outbreaks of generally light rain and drizzle in the far north of Scotland. Some low cloud for much of Scotland and Northern Ireland. That will keep things frost and fog free here overnight. But fairly extensive low cloud, mist and fog will develop across large parts of England and Wales, particularly eastern England. Low cloud also affecting South Wales, central and southwest England. 
through the night. And this low cloud mist and fog will be slow to clear if it does clear during Saturday. Some places staying grey and gloomy through much of the day with poor visibility, especially for eastern England. Some brighter spells further north and west. But a few showers also possible for western areas and the far north. Another cold day where that fog and low cloud lingers. Temperatures not rising above the low single figures. And then a lot of cloud remains into Saturday night. But one change on the way, a band of rain pushing into the far northwest as we end Saturday. That will sweep south across the country by Sunday, clearing the skies, leading to sunnier conditions in the north during Sunday. But uh, cloud remains further south. Join me, Gloria De Piero, Monday to Thursday at noon for The Briefing. We go to the parts of Parliament that you won't see elsewhere. Plus, there's exclusive interviews with MPs from all parties. But quite often, they paper over the real truth. Why does a working class lad like you join the Tories? That's a good question. Don't miss it. Monday to Thursdays at noon on GB News. Hello there, I'm Eamon. And I'm Isabel. And you're watching the GB News digital stream across the United Kingdom. And around the world. If you're here in the UK, you can also watch us on your TV screen. GB News is Freeview Channel 236. On Sky, we're Channel 515. 626 on Virgin Media. Just remember, you might need to retune your TV to watch the channel. Yeah, and if you are doing that, find out more about retuning by going to gbnews.uk. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from 6 to half past 9 on GB News.